All right, let's try that again. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Atlanta History Center. We are so appreciative of you all making the trek out tonight. Um, I feel like every night we've had an author talk, I've had to say thank you for coming out in the rain and then whatever's going on out there. We're just glad that you're here with us tonight. Um, ahead of Super Bowl Sunday, so you're getting your celebration started a little bit early with us tonight and with Greg Fitheri. Uh, for his new, his book, Gridiron Legacy, if you have not yet purchased your copy of the book, they are for sale outside, and Greg is happy to sign it for you after the talk tonight. Um, he's going to talk for a while about the history of pro football. There's some great photos in this slideshow. I'm really excited for y'all to see it. When he's done, he'll take some audience questions. I will have a microphone. I know we're in a small room, but our um, recording only picks up sound from microphones. So if you'll just do me a favor and ask your question in the mic, uh, we'll be sure that we get that question on the recording tonight. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our guest tonight, and then we'll let him get started with his presentation. So this book has been a labor of love for many years. He's been working on the research for this book for over 10 years. Uh, so you're seeing culmination of that tonight. Um, he mentioned that being a writer is not his day job. On his day, he's from Pennsylvania, lives in Atlanta, and his day job is uh, the president of Integra Evaluation and Advisory Services. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Greg Fissery. Thanks very much, Claire. Thanks to the you uh, as the decision maker for approving this event and uh, enjoying the book and uh, to the History Center for, for hosting. Um, nice turnout tonight, Super Bowl week. No coincidence, we, we planned that. And i um, excited to share my story with you. So um, we're gonna get started. Hope I haven't tested this yet, but um, okay. Another trivia question. Who knows the name um, of the stadium in Phoenix where the Super Bowl 57 is gonna be played this week? You might see it on the screen. Did you know that beforehand? <laughs> you, did you think there's, does anybody sense a conspiracy? <laughs> you know, everybody loves a conspiracy theory. But everything kind of went the Chiefs way against, uh, you know, in that last playoff game, <laughs> didn't it? In, in, yeah, at the end? Not if they're Bengals fans. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean the Bengals, I, there was a rumor that um, the Bengals coach was seen saying on si silently, it's rigged. I, I don't know if that's true or not. But um, yeah, that, it's a little odd. So careful about putting your money on the Eagles, I think. The fix could be in. So <laughs> there's a theme about fixes as, as we go through this story. So uh, it's funny, as, as I was saying in my little quiz session before we started, that so few people know about the history and the origins of pro football because when we were growing up, baseball was king. It was America's pastime. Football was a distant second. Um, uh, and, you know, I, with the Super Bowl era starting in the 60s, it really gained popularity. But um, it's debatable, and I had some heated <laughs> debates with some other historians about when football became our most popular sport. And statistically, I think by TV viewership, and it, it happened sometime in the late 70s, early 80s. But to me, in my opinion, and a lot of people, I, I did another event last night, everybody was nodding when I said that it was the strike of 94 that really was, was the tipping point, um, the last straw maybe. P people were so disappointed that the players went on strike and there was no World Series. There were a lot of great stories that year. The Expos were in first place with a young Pedro Martinez, and um, the White Sox were in first place for the first time. You know, look, get a little closer. Okay, should, should I should I hold it? Maybe is that better? Can I walk? Okay, let's do that. I don't like to be stationary, fidgety. Um, so uh, even my cousin. Um, oh, I thought I had it in there. Where, where did it go? Did we miss a slide? Uh, oh, oh. There he is. Might have used the last presentation, Claire. Um, my cousin Bob Zupsik was playing for the White Sox uh, that year in 94, and they were loaded with Frank Thomas and Carlton Fisk, Ozzie Gann, Tim Raines. I could go through the whole Robin Ventura. 
Jack McDowell, I think, and then Bob was playing right field. And uh, it was his last year. Um, he never got to play another game, and he might have gotten to play in the World Series that year. So I definitely lost my love of baseball after that, and I think a lot of people did, too. So, um, yes, I grew up in Pittsburgh, and uh, during the great time, it was called the City of Champions in, in 1979 when we won both the World Series and the um, Super Bowl. And that's me on the right with Willie Stargell. Um, I know what year that is because Roberto Clemente's patch is on his sleeve. He died the year before that, December 31st, 72. And so that was the 73 season. I was nine years old. And um, Tony Dorsett, we called him Dorsett when he was, he became Dorsett in Dallas, but um, even Pitt won a national championship. So good times. And even the Penguins came around and, and Mario Lemieux and won several Stanley Cups. So um, I have to say a word about Franco Harris as, as well. And I meant to have a book up with me. Could I, could I borrow a book from, from someone? Um, Franco wrote the foreword, thank you, for my book. And um, it was a real pleasure getting to know him in the last couple of years uh, as an adult. I met him a couple of times just as a, a kid and a fan. But um, we got to work together at the Senator John Hines History Center on their advisory board called the Champions Committee because I donated a lot of things to the museum, collectibles, baseball cards, and things. And, um, and so they invited me to be on this committee, and Franco was the head of the committee. And the first day I was there, back in 2012, he, uh, we all introduced ourselves, and he, I, I could tell he really listened you know, when I mentioned about this project that I was working on. And he approached me afterward and, and expressed his interest. He said, anything I can do to help, let me know. I was like, wow. <laughs> so yeah, I said, uh, <laughs> how about doing the forward? You know, some, when he said, yeah, sure. Um, let me know when you're ready. And I said, well, I, I have a lot of work ahead of me, but uh, I will definitely let you know. And he was such a thoughtful person. He said something I'll never forget that um, he said, you have something really special here. You, you, it's, it's an evergreen story. He said, don't worry about rushing. He says, just do a good job and uh, <coughs> it'll be ready when it's supposed to be ready. And I said, wow, that was meaningful. So um, when I was finally ready, uh, I guess it was early, you know, I had to finish all the writing and everything and before I got the quotes and asked for the forward. So it's probably end of 21, early 22, I circled back with him and he pretended to forget that he promised to do it. He, he, he said, did I really say I would do that? <laughs> he said, yes. He said, oh, I'm just kidding. So um, he said, send me, I had to send him the soft copy, the PDF of the book and let him read it before he finally agreed. And and uh, he said, call, that was a Friday, he said, call me on Monday, check in with me, and, uh, and so I did, and he said, well, I didn't get to read the whole thing, obviously, but um, uh, I read the beginning and the introduction, he said, wow, he, he said, you're a really good writer, and I said, well, that's great, thanks, he said, there's one line that really grabbed me, and, and uh, I, I, I said, I bet I know which one it was, he said, really, I said, yes, in the, the introduction, it was the first line, he said, I really struggled with the introduction because it was different than the rest of the book. I, it was sort of why it was important that I do it, not just the story itself. And, and so I wrote this one. Uh, I said, I woke up in the middle of the night, and, and I, I had the idea. Uh, and and I, I went to the kitchen in the dark and, and just pounded it out in about 30 minutes. And, um, he, and I said this line to him, and, um, and he said, that was it. And uh, so I'm going to find it here real quick. Uh, and if I can't get it exact, exactly, I, I'll be able to tell you. That here we go. Um, we live for moments as athletes when, in a flash of glory, we become more than we thought we could be. Some of these experiences last for mere seconds and are experienced alone. 
Others accumulate over a career, may be carried with us for the rest of our lives and thrill the world. And he said that really, I really connected with that. And I, I said, well, sure, you had the Immaculate Reception. Who <laughs> 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 I mean, gets better than that? And, and uh, I mean, it's a legendary. He said, no. He said, that's not it. And he said it was the other part that it was something that I did that nobody else saw. That it, was, it just meant something to me. In a, it was in a game against the Cowboys. And I said, wow, was it the Super Bowl? One of the Super Bowls? They played twice in the Super Bowl. He said, no, it was a regular season game. And uh, he said, I, I used to lay in bed and think of this move that I wanted to make you know, and imagine making it. And in this game, I did it. And it worked. And I, and I totally twisted this linebacker named Lewis around and he tripped all D.D. Lewis yes I remember D.D. Lewis he said yeah him and, and he, <laughs> he said I, I don't even know if D.D. knew what what I did or how but I scored and I it just meant a lot to me and, and it's sort of the, the magic of being an athlete and doing something special and just was I think that's why we all love to play and um, why people, you know, th these guys decided to start the sport of pro football. And um, he said, years later, he saw D.D. Lewis speak somewhere. And D.D. somehow talked about <laughs> this play. <laughs> and he said, Franco put this move on me, and I ended up with my hand inside my face mask. <laughs> he said, gotcha. <laughs> so... Um, that was Franco. He was funny, he was kind and thoughtful, and uh, he's missed by many, many people. So, um, that is Frenchie Fuqua with Franco there, the other guy in the Immaculate Reception who tipped, may have tipped the ball when he collided with Jack Tatum and before Franco caught it. And that was at the 40th anniversary party of the Immaculate Reception in Pittsburgh. And he was supposed to have the 50th just you know, the week that he passed away. So, um, yeah. So uh, after Pittsburgh, um, my formative years there, I went off to Georgetown for, for college. And we had good sports there too. We had Patrick Ewing and they won the national championship in 1984 and several famous alumni. That's me with John Thompson. It's a very hard thing to get a picture with John Thompson. He was not the friendliest fellow. But um, uh, he, he softened up as he got older. Famous, I lived in Bill Clinton's dorm. We didn't know Bill Clinton back then. When I was there, he became famous after I graduated. But um, uh, that was at a, at a reunion. It was his, let's see, I think it was my 30th, and it was his 50th reunion a few years back. And um, But if we learn nothing else at uh, a Jesuit school, it's that we all fall short of the glory of God, as Bill, and all of us certainly have. So... Um, and this is another theme that runs through the story because as I entered the business world, I encountered several companies that fell short of the glory of God. Uh, and it was a, a rough time. A lot of people went from my school, went uh, off to Wall Street, and it was Gordon Gecko, you know, Michael Milken, and, and uh, tough times, uh, followed by Enron, Freddie Mac, you know, WorldCom, all those things, Martha Stewart's insider trading. And, um, I had, many of them went to jail. And of all the companies I worked for, they included Freddie Mac and WorldCom. So uh, it was pretty shocking, but, but I, I ended up leaving like the Teflon Don uh, before both companies got in trouble. I also worked for an internet company that failed here in Atlanta. Some of you might remember Bert Ellis's IXL company. I worked for a little subsidiary of there's called youdecide.com that didn't do so well either. <laughs> but it got me interested in the internet and, and technology. And But after about 15 years of working for six or seven companies that all failed in scandal, I was frankly depressed <laughs> and wondering what the hell I was going to do <laughs> with my life to find some meaning. So I was unemployed uh, for a brief time after the dot-com bubble burst and um, had a young child, and my wife was going off to work. And I said, I, I just needed something different. For, and, and that's when I started 
uh, passion project to, to research pro the history of pro football. And um, so, so off I went. Um, well, where are we going? And uh, to tell the story, I, I realized I really had to start fr from the beginning. Um, how, did, how did American football come to be? And most people can imagine that it came out of rugby, which came out of soccer. And um, we get mocked many times by the Euros for calling our sport football. And you don't even use your foot. <laughs> what do you call it? Soccer f for. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, um, don't call it, you know, we call it football. But the funny thing is that the word soccer is not an American word. It's actually a, a British word that comes out of what the, s the real name of the sport was association football and it got truncated to soccer like rub rugby was rugger so they called it soccer so it's their fault <laughs> and um so basically <laughs> the sport of american football bef just as an amateur thing started in the early 1860s just before the civil war in boston and um, they called it the Boston game, and, and they started playing this game that looked a lot like rugby um, at the intramural level. And um, it sort of evolved in, into it's something of, it of its own. But um, in the Civil War, the first images of the game uh, started showing up in some magazines. Harper's and, uh, was one of the, the big magazines back then. And no particular rules, no particular number of players. They were just sort of free-forming around with, with this game that was called football in, in the caption. And then after the Civil War, the first college football game was played between Princeton and Rutgers in 1869 in New Jersey. And um, the, the Rutgers, they were blue and red scarves in their heads. The, the scarlet sc scars led to their nickname, the Scarlet Knights. And... Um, so on the college game went, and, and then it, the Ivy League ran with it. Yale and Princeton in particular were the dominant teams, but all the other schools in the, the league were pretty strong. And, um, but Yale really took the lead, in particular this fellow Walter Camp, who became known as the father of American football. And he played, um, not a particularly outstanding player, but he loved the game so much, he stayed on to administer the, the committees that eventually became the NCAA and, and um, changed rules you know, quickly a, as the game beca became more and more uh, American and distinguished from, from rugby. Uh, really instrumental in cr the most significant rule changes, uh, including the line of scrimmage, uh, which you know, rugby just had the scrum and, and so sort of a continuous play. So creating positions, quarterback, running back, and, you know, tackles, guards, th that was all new. And uh, the, f the snap, you know, and, and calling plays. So it was all led by Walter Camp. So after the, um, the game goes on for a couple decades, young men enjo enjoyed playing after college, and there was amateur club football. And so imagine Cherokee across the street or Ansley in Capital City and having football teams. And they also had basketball teams and uh, track and wrestling and, and so on. And they all participated under the umbrella of the AAU, which is still around today, Amateur Athletic Union. And to stay compliant with the AAU, you could not pay any player. You know, if you got caught paying cash, you were out and couldn't compete in any of their national championships. So uh, that was a strong incentive to try to be honest, but they would always sneak around like cat and mouse with food and watches and things that they could pawn at the, the pawn shop and then the club would go and buy the thing back and just keep passing it around. So th there, was, there was always shenanigans, just like today. Um, so th uh, it really, club football grew fastest in Pittsburgh because there was a lot of money in Pittsburgh to develop these clubs I in the Industrial Revolution, um, the steel industry, and so on. And so Allegheny and P Pittsburgh, Duquesne, Latrobe, where Ar Arnold Palmer was from, and Greensburg nearby Latrobe had the, the biggest, best um, amateur teams. But eventually, of course, somebody was going to get paid. 
and they did. But the question was who? So when, when the, who was the first pro player? If anybody knows, I'd be amazed. Um, the Hall of Fame, though, when it opened in the 60s, had to be able to tell the story. And they still, it still really wasn't certain. But there was a fellow named John Brailier, who's not in the slideshow, but his picture is over there on that easel. He was on the Latrobe team. And forever, Latrobe thought it was the birthplace of pro football because he was the first to admit that he had received $10 uh, when he was in high school, 16 years old, I think, to go fill in as a quarterback. He was a highly recruited high school player, but um, the Latrobe team lot quarterback got hurt. They wanted him to play. He said, no, nah, you know. Um, but when they threw $10 at him, he, he said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. So... Um, he bragged about it as an adult. He became a much beloved dentist in Latrobe and, and loved the honor of, of that. And the NFL gave him a lifetime pass to attend all of its games for free with the number one on his pass. <laughs> However, when the Hall of Fame opened, they discovered otherwise. The, the Steelers uh, had a, a lot of archives and, and documents, and they sent a bunch of things out to the Hall of Fame. And they looked through them and discovered an accounting ledger, it's always the accountants that get in trouble, <laughs> that showed that another fellow was paid three years earlier $500, not $10, $500, um, which is over like a hundred grand, I think, today, to, to play one game to help Allegheny beat its rival Pittsburgh. And he scored, uh, he was an All-American at Yale. He, he recovered a fumble after a tap big hit and ran for a four-point touchdown, and they won four to nothing. So this document has become known as the birth certificate of pro football, and it is on display in Canton in the very first exhibit in the rotunda, which is a timeline there. So that's been settled. It could have been somebody else might have, but it's the first documented pro player. And it goes quickly from there. Um, the next year, the first contract is signed um, by a fellow that played at Pitt named Dybert. He got 50 bucks per game in his contract. And this other fellow is very interesting in, in, on the left. His name is James Lallis. Uh, in 1895, while he was still playing, he started his own club team, amateur team, and trained up the next group of pros that were coming up. And on that team, was this fellow named Shiring, Bob Shiring. And he played there in 1899 and 1900, and, and they won the uh, Western Pennsylvania State Amateur Championship both years. So the pro teams didn't have a full pro schedule. There wasn't an organized league or anything. So they also played college teams and amateur teams. And um, so another team called Homestead came into the mix as, as a professional team. And it was owned or, or partially owned by a guy named William Chase Temple, not from Temple University, but the Temple Orange, Oranges. He um, had been one of the, the first professional owner of the Duquesne team. He had a falling out with them and decided to go join some other friends at Homestead and compete with them in, instead. And um, so they outbid a lot of the other teams for their players and became the world champion in 1900. And during that season, when they played this Lallis amateur team, they saw how good Bob Shiring was, and they invited him to join the team. So all of these Ivy League All-Americans, most of them from Penn, Princeton, Yale, so on, brought on a, a local kid from Pittsburgh with an eighth grade education. Uh, to be the center, the backups, which was the most important position on the team before the forward pass because it was all still running. It's a pretty amazing leap. And um, so in 1901, he, he actually plays a lot more. And um, 1901 also was the start of a, a pro, the first pro team in Philadelphia. So Philadelphia challenged Homestead to come across for the world championship. And they accepted uh, with the incentive of this, I think, I also wanted you to observe, by the way, this trophy that was very cool that I saw in, in a uh, newspaper in Pittsburgh, the 1900 trophy that was sponsored by that newspaper to, as an incentive to get the teams to agree to a 
to play each other because there was so much dissension between the teams and they, they didn't even want to play each other. So they all played for that very interesting loving cup. The next year, another trophy was put up by Bailey Banks and Biddle to uh, sort of looks like the Stanley Cup a bit uh, for the Philadelphia Homestead game. And on the way, I, I discovered this in an old uh, microfilm in, in a uh, library in Homestead, Pennsylvania. The train went off the rails, it crashed. It was a miracle that they all didn't die. There was, when you go through those old papers, it was more dangerous to work in, in, a, in a mill or on a, in the railroad than it was to play football because there were constantly terrible accidents. But this train wreck, they, they survived, they got to Philadelphia, and they won and the, the world championship again. However, no team, no professional team ever made money. They all always lost money. They, they, weather was usually the culprit. Uh, snow, floods, uh, people just didn't show up like they thought, and they overpaid the players. So. The rich industrialists didn't care. They, they did it for fun and, and the love uh, of the game and, and the, the recreation, the entertainment for the, for the communities, the prestige, um, and they could afford it. So, none the, um, but for only for so long. So um, after 1901, even Homestead uh, dissolved, but, uh, and the teams basically combined and merged, and there were fewer and fewer until 1902 when there was only really one main pro team left in Pittsburgh. Um, this is a program from the 1901 season that I um, discovered, found through a collector, and uh, it's very, very interesting uh, discovery. And there's that uh, trophy in from 1901 again. So, but they were getting good crowds. They, they got, uh, normally I think the crowds were about 1,500 to 1,000 people for the regular games. And then when the big championship games came up, they, they could get up seven to 10,000 people, um, which was pretty good. So, but the, the Philadelphia team um, got better. They were just getting started in 1901. They, they um, mostly a bunch of Penn players and Penn had won the national championship in 1901, I think, or, or maybe the year before. Um, but um, so 1902 was the last year of pro football in Pittsburgh at that time, the, the 10 years of run of, of pro football. Uh, they tried to bring pe more people out by bringing on Christy Mathewson, who some of you might recognize as one of the great pitchers of all time. He was probably maybe the best pitcher of all time with Walter Johnson. I mean, he's, he's right up there. And um, they called him Big Six. And he won three games in the 1905 World Series for the New York Giants and, um, and uh, was known as the Christian Gentleman, which uh, among baseball players who were largely pretty rough, a rough crowd back then, it was odd that he was thought of. So he, he was really a national icon. So bringing him onto the football team did bring some people out, but he wasn't a major player. I think he was just a punter for the most part, a little bit of a running back. And... The story goes that he said he would only play football if Bob Shiring was there to block for him to keep him healthy for his baseball career. So that picture uh, on the right of him in his football uniform is very uh, one of a kind that, that I discovered. Um, it's a, a team photo album from 1902. Each player had its own page with his name, nickname, college, height, weight, and so on. And that's one of the cards from the famous Hannes Wagner set, you know, the million dollar Hannes Wagner card was from 1909, uh, the same series. So, um, so Philadelphia, you know, again, challenged them. And interesting character uh, in this throughout the book, um, Shiring and, and Blondie Wallace are, are basically the two main characters, the opposing captains um, throughout several years. Blondie um, was an All-American at Penn um, he was elected captain for his senior year. He grew up in Atlantic City. S somehow sneakily didn't really graduate from high school. There's a private school called Petty there th th where they won two state championships, but somehow still got himself into Penn and then didn't graduate again. Uh, didn't pay his bills, was behind, because I guess he didn't get a scholarship, but um, in his grades, he was basically flunking out. 
So he leaves early, uh, after being elected captain, doesn't stay for his senior year, and he starts the first pro football team in Philadelphia with the help of Cornelius McGillicuddy, a.k.a. Connie Mack, who was the manager of the Philadelphia A's baseball team. So he got Connie Mack to support the football team. Connie said he lost his shirt <laughs> financially on this venture, too. But... Um, off they went, and, and they, they continued to improve uh, the, their, their team and um, had a, a couple-game series with Pittsburgh this year. So Philadelphia actually won the first one, and um, um, I think the second one actually they played to a tie in Pittsburgh, so they, they, they played again, and um, – Pittsburgh won, so sort of like in boxing, the, the team that wins the last game got the championship. And, but there was a lot of rumors started to be going around about predictions being made about the outcomes, and, and, and gamblers, gambling was everywhere. I mean, it, um, uh, at baseball games, obviously it, it got into baseball with the Black Sox in 1919, but uh, there was even a picture in the book of Christy Mathewson pitching in front of a sign on the field that said, no gambling allowed. So that's how pervasive gambling was. But um, so there were rumors of conspiracy and a fix, you know, to sort of like the State Farm thing. But nothing was ever proved in Pittsburgh one. But it was the last year of pro football in Pittsburgh. So, however, there were strong teams in Ohio. So that was sort of the end of what I call the first quarter in the book. And it moves into the next chapter, uh, the Ohio League era. And uh, Maslin, Canton, Akron, and so on had strong teams, but they were amateur and they played for a state championship. And has anybody ever been to Maslin, Ohio? It is the most amazing small town. It's, I compare it to Athens, sort of, the, the, the spirit of the place, although it's not a college town, it's still a high school town. But the tr tradition there is unlike anything in the country, except maybe Valdosta, they say, are the two biggest high school programs in the country and they're actually going to play this year for the in, in Ohio which is a big deal and so um, Maslin hates losing to Canton in anything and they sort of have a little brother complex and they got the idea their quarterback was named EJ Stewart and he wore a lot of hats but another main character in the story um, he was the amateur quarterback, he was the sports editor for the Maslin newspaper, and he was a politician of sorts, lost his run for mayor, but he, he was a city clerk of some kind. And he got the idea to go get some of the pros from Pittsburgh to come out on the, on the sly and whoop up on Canton. So he did, and he went and got Bob Shiring and three of his teammates to come and win uh, the state, the, the championship game at the end of 1903 against Akron. And nobody really, they kind of figured it out after that they'd been snookered. And so for the next year, they went and everybody else did the same thing. So pro in the meantime, Blondie Wallace took his F Philadelphia friends to another town in Pennsylvania called Franklin, sort of near Erie, around that er area. And... Um, just destroyed everybody. I mean, they, they, there was a big rivalry between Franklin, I think Oil City, or, and, and a lot, <laughs> just the, the, the money that changed hands between gamblers um, was, was significant, and, and Blondie helped them, you know, that community win a lot of money after losing it all the year before. So, um, 1904 comes, and, and those, the ringers, the four that came from Pittsburgh, including Bob Shiring, stay on. And um, they continue to dominate everybody by an aggregate score of 402 to 11 in the seven games that they played. But they had a very competitive game against Akron in the state championship game where touchdowns were worth five points. Akron scored first, missed the extra point. Maslin scored at the end of the game, and it all came down to that point. And when you scored then, there were no hash marks, and you had to try to kick from whatever angle you crossed the goal line. So if you score in the corner, you got a really tough kick. And they did. So they had this big angle, and, and it was snowing, and there was mud, and it was sort of like Tom Brady in the snow game. They, they sort of, you know, brought the <laughs> wiped the ball, and they wiped the spot, and put the finger under the – and they made the extra point. And the fans stormed the field. 
And the referee said, no good, because you put your finger under the ball. You can't do that. <laughs> so they had to clear the field. They came back out, and he made it again, and they won 6-5. to five. So, um, so Canton really didn't have a, a, a team that year. Was they, they were sort of watching to see how this would all go and this pro thing. But they decided they couldn't stand to, to be not be part of this and have Maslin get all the glory. So they went and got Blondie Wallace. For, and and um, when their captain got hurt in the middle of the season, and Blondie was sort of like the first Bill Parcells. Remember when he said, you know, I'll only take the job if I get full control. I, you know, I want the checkbook. I want to bring all my players. And so, so they said, fine, just win. And he said, I guarantee it. So they, um, it all builds up to the, the championship game, and um, they went and just had a nuclear, you know, armament period where they got the best players from around the country. Now they went west to Michigan and Notre Dame to get their best players. Willie Heston was a legend at the time. He went to Canton. Red Salmon, not as well known, went went to Notre Dame and went to to Maslin, and. Um, after putting up three figures on some teams, because you didn't have to give up the ball when you scored back then. If, if you it was make it take, ta you, you just kept getting the ball. You didn't have to give back the ball <laughs> until you didn't score. So that's how they could score 100 points. Um, they, get, they get into the game, and um, um, Maslin wins again. Blondie's guarantee failed. And that's a program from the game over there. There's only about three that known in the world, including that one that I have. And uh, postcards start, started going around the country. It was a, getting to be a really big deal. And um, Maslin always got credit for having more teamwork, a you know, better team concept, whereas Philadelphia was a bunch of individual all-stars. And they were figuring out that you really had to play <laughs> as a team to be effective. They didn't quite have all the talent, but they, they had a better system. So um, Salmon from Notre Dame scored both touchdowns, and, and Willie Heston was hurt on the first play so and, and came in overweight, apparently, and took a lot of money and didn't do a lot of good stuff on the field. So Maslin keeps winning. And um, so 1905 turned out, uh, outside the pro realm, to be – a very important transitional year in the in the game. Um, Twenty plus people died from football injuries uh, that year. Not none in the pro level, but mostly in college and high school and other amateur uh, games. The rules were not good. They 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 allowed this thing called the flying wedge, which um, was a V formation, and they would basically attack the weakest player and the, the ball carrier behind, you know, within the V. And, and a, a lot of broken necks, broken backs, head injuries. A lot of them didn't even wear helmets, very few pads. So the turning point was a game between Penn, again, and, and a tiny Swarthmore College in Philadelphia where um, a heroic player named Bob Tiny Maxwell played. And everybody said, why did the best player in the country play at Swarthmore? Well, when he played at Chicago, University of Chicago under Amos Alonzo Stagg, Stagg called him fatty or tubby, and he had his feelings hurt. <laughs> so he left and transferred to Swarthmore where they affectionately called him Tiny. And so Tiny Maxwell um, led Swarthmore against Penn in the first ga game of the season, I believe, early in the season, and Penn was just stronger, and, and they won. They were winning the game at the end, and, and the quarterback named Vince Stevenson said, Tiny, you played the greatest game I've, we've ever seen. He said, just relax now. The <laughs> game's over. We're going to run out the clock. And so, you know, he relaxes, and the last play of the game, Stevenson doesn't take the knee, and he does a quarterback sneak, runs through the line, and blasts Maxwell in the face with his forearm, and shattered his nose, blood everywhere. And the legend has it that the photo of Maxwell's face showed up in the papers, and people were appalled. And um, President Roosevelt saw it and said, that's it. We're changing. We've got to change the rules. He said, I don't want to kill the game. I love football. My son plays at Harvard. But we're going to fix it. You know, somebody's got to fix it, or I will. 
So we got Walter Camp and Amos Alonzo Stagg and John Heisman, and they formed what a committee, and they changed the rules um, significantly in 1906 in college and high school to create the line of scrimmage and the forward pass most significantly, and it was 10 yards instead of five for a first down. So, and eventually, f not that year, but I th another couple years later, four downs instead of three. And anybody that's ever seen a Canadian football game knows that they still have three downs. And that was originally American football too, until 1906. So 1906, in the midst of this incredible professional rivalry, they've got to entirely change how they play the game and figure out how to throw the ball. And if it was, unfortunately, uh, an incomplete pass was also considered a fumble at the time. So it wasn't widely attempted, very strategically used. But um, uh, on the, they went, and, and in 1906, um, there's Teddy's son, I think, at, at, at Harvard playing football, and um, um, it, w it wasn't very well accepted, but, but that was going to be the way that it went. So um, now Blondie's got some explaining to do in 1906. He, the Canton Club would no longer sponsor the team because they lost money and, and he overspent. And so to keep the team, he had to agree to accept full financial responsibility for it, which and no team had ever made money. So there's a, a huge risk that he took to keep the Canton, what this year became the Canton Bulldogs. Uh, they were known as the Canton Giants at first. They became the Bulldogs uh, this, this year. Um, quick story about very, very the Maslin Tigers became the Maslin Tigers because when they formed, they had to get uniforms. And the only uniforms available at the sporting goods store were the Princeton Tigers uniforms. <laughs> so they went and bought all the <laughs> Princeton jerseys and they became the Maslin Tigers. That was, well, that was known. What wasn't known is how the Bulldogs became the Bulldogs. And I'm writing the book and I really wanted to dig in. I go down all these rabbit holes. I said, how did that? So I have the newspapers. I'm going day by day. By and I had daily papers that nobody had ever seen. That had never been digitized from the people in Maslin that took care of me. Because only weekend papers made their their libraries and their microfilms. So when was the first time they, they're called the Bulldogs? And all they're just called the Bulldogs one day right before the Maslin game. And uh, without any explanation, it was very disappointing. So I just thought about it. I said, well, you had the Princeton Tigers and you had the Yale Bulldogs. I'm guessing they just wanted to be as prestigious as Met can't as Maslin, so they took the best college team. I, that's, and that's my guess. It's in the book, so <laughs> nobody can prove me wrong. Um, and I've I've never even heard anybody else take a guess, so my guess is as good as anybody. But um, so, Blondie throws caution to the wind, and he says, in ni early 1906, he goes and outbids. Can't uh, Maslin for some of their players. This was unheard of before, and it really lit, you know, the fire that never st stopped burning. Right? Uh, it, the the, the furor that, that it set off in Maslin that they stole some of their players really took the rivalry, you know, to to another level, and um, and the hatred, you know, between the teams and the negotiations for the games that they would play at the end of the year were very spiteful in the newspapers. E.J. Stewart hated. Wallace, more than Wallace really seemed to hate Stewart, but Wallace wasn't going to back down, you know, to, just because Maslin was the champion. He's, I mean, he's like, look, at me, I'm a national championship, I'm good looking, I'm a player, y you got nothing, you know, EJ. So, but EJ had the championship and the title and, and, and it went back and forth. Blondie wouldn't agree to even let Maslin have the Thanksgiving game, which was the big money game. And he said, I, if we don't get Thanksgiving, I'm not playing. And so, he had actually refused to play until EJ realized that <laughs> they were go all going to lose money if they didn't play. And, and, and um, I think they, they, they did give Maslin a Thanksgiving game, but they did get an even share, at least Canton did, which was unheard of, too. It was usually two-thirds a third. So Blondie was a tough negotiator and um, stood up for his side, especially since he had all his skin in the game. So... Um, Interesting um, side, side note that's in the book. By definition, the first forward pass happened in 1906. So 
It happened in a Maslin game. This, the history, including the Hall of Fame, shows that a guy, their quarterback named Peggy Parrot, George Parrot, Peggy was his nickname, threw the pass in about the fourth game of the season, which didn't kind of make sense, but that's how, what history shows. As I'm going through the, um, the newspapers that I have that nobody else had, I saw that there was a forward pass thrown two weeks before the Hall of Fame said the pass was. And not only that, it was by a different quarterback. So I called my friends at the Hall of Fame and I said, hey, Tim, not my buddy, have that article go. He said he always th thought that it was going to turn out to be some other team and that Mike, you know, um, and, and he said, well, I, I think you're going to be disappointed. I found an earlier, you know, forward pass like October 15th, and, and I said, really? So that's too bad, because I found one on the 14th. He said, no, where'd you get that? Those guys in Maslin gave you those papers. I said, yep. So because Blondie stole the tight end, the end, the quarterback, Parrott, went to play end, because he played college basketball at Case Western in Ohio, and they moved another guy named Charlie Moran, who later became a famous umpire, Uncle Charlie, they called him, in, in the National League until into the 30s, played quarter through the first forward pass to P George Parrott for a touchdown. And um, so I had to re... They, to they agree. I mean, I, it's clear as day in the paper. It's Tigers throw the forward pass for the first time. And uh, they said, you, yeah, you're right, but th they haven't changed their exhibits yet. But <laughs> so... Um, so what the, uh, after Blondie builds his team up, I, I, I he also goes to Penn and gets Vince Stevenson, the quarterback, the, the thug that blasted Tiny Maxwell the year before. So what does Maslin do? They went and got Tiny Maxwell. <laughs> he said, you want to play on a real team? You want to get revenge against Stevenson and all those guys from Penn? Let's go. A and he did. And um, so the stage was set for the two games that they agreed to play. And this was the first game. Canton actually won. Blondie had his big day in the sun in Canton. And uh, 10 to 5. So big celebration. That's a program for the game. At the time I found that program on eBay, it was the only one known in the world from that game. Somebody else found one a couple years later. but And I paid a lot more for mine than that guy did. But um, a couple weeks later, they go to Maslin and play. And notice the, gr the checkerboard on, on the field. Um, at for a couple years, that, that was th there when they had the forward, it wasn't just the forward pass, but there were some strange rules. The quarterback wasn't allowed to run up the middle. He had to run at least five yards outside. And the forward pass had to go at least five yards. And they used these vertical lines to try to officiate then it was a disaster so they they that came and went pretty quickly but uh, Maslin won um, and, and, and regained the championship at least people thought um, and oddly you know, th there was talking about gambling rumors had been going around that they were going to split the games that, that was the plan and that there was going to be a third game so every like Don King would pull off in a boxing scheme, and um, and so it was too convenient that Canton won in Canton and Maslin won in Maslin, and so literally that night after the second game in the Canton hotel called the Cortland, where there there was a bar and a lot of the players were drowning their sorrows on the Bulldog side. Some of the fans came in and stirred the pot. Somebody stood up and screamed, "These games were fixed." And the players didn't like it. They lost. They were drunk. And a brawl broke out. And just like in a Burt Reynolds movie, somebody went through the glass window. True story. And there was bedlam. And people wanted answers about whether this game was real, whether it was on the up and up. So that E.J. Stewart guy, being the sports editor, writes a full page, front page story the next day in the Maslin paper describing, claiming that their players didn't violate their honor, the famous Tigers couldn't be bought off with a price. Uh, so please believe us. However, 
And there's not going to be a third game, even though we split, so forget that. We're, we're, there's not, but um, at least so he said. And he, however, he admitted that there was an attempted bribe, that, that, that one of their players named Walter East, who was a baseball manager from an, the Akron minor league team, infiltrated their team and offered a $50,000, which is more than a million dollars today, to Bob Shiring, the captain in 1906. So imagine the, the captain of the, all these all Ivy League All-Americans being the kid from Pittsburgh without a high school <laughs> education. Um, and, but Shiring wouldn't do it. So they went to Tiny Maxwell, and he wouldn't do it. And they both went to their coach and said, this is what's going on. And the coach went to E.J. Stewart and said, this is what's going on. And they totally made a, a mess of the whole thing. They went to the Canton team, told them what was happening, agreed to squash it until after the game so the fans would come out. And it still blew up. In the, pa in the paper, in the story, they said, we cut Walter East early in the season. Nobody knew why. He was a good player. And that's why we cut him. But they also blamed Blondie Wallace for colluding in the scheme. And that set off, um, uh-oh, what happened, Claire? Um, that set off a controversy because Blondie uh, denied it. Walter East admitted it. He said, yes, I did. what are you going to do? He said, I fixed a college football game at Pitt when I was there. I fixed baseball games in Akron. Say la vie. Um, but Blondie, he, he even said, leave Blondie out of this. He didn't have anything to do with it. So Blondie um, sues. Thanks, Claire. Blondie sues for over $30,000 for the loss of his reputation. He doesn't know what else he's going to do. He, he wanted to own a bar in Canton and, um, and, re and, and live there after football and be a hero. And um, so... He tried to sue the mass on paper and the team and the industrialists that own the team. And the case, so I was like, this is fascinating. Why has why this story never been told? And so I'm following the newspapers, you know, uh, wherever I can get them. No books been written. A few articles mention the scandal, but nobody's ever really knew what happened. Or, or and, and Blondie basically went down in history as a bad guy. People assumed, there we go again, Claire. Um, that that he was guilty. He he was a bad he a bad guy forever. So um, the case dragged on from 1906 into 1908, and very unfortunate kind of mellow or whatever the the word is. It was sort of a a uh, disappointing ending. He he supposedly ran out of money and dropped the case for not being able to continue to pay court costs and legal fees. Um, but people still assumed that he was a bad guy, that he, um, he probably got paid off or they settled. And it was odd, though, that he was he fought so hard for so long and, but, and just kind of went away and, and left Canton sort of between with his tail between his legs and, and went back to Atlantic City where he grew up and eventually during Prohibition became not just any old bootlegger, but the biggest bootlegger in the country. And leveraged his fame for, for success. And, and the feds chased him around for several years into the 30s and, um, and eventually put him in jail for tax evasion, like, like Al Capone. So, uh, and he died of liver disease shortly after getting out of jail in, in the late 30s. So a very sad uh, outcome, especially if it wasn't true that he participated in this scheme, which he always denied. And um, so it, it becomes sort of a, a morality play. You know, you look at Bob Shiring on the one hand, who, who everybody thought was a hero and, and wore the white hat and never did anything wrong, and um, went back to Pittsburgh after his football career. And, and, and basically, pro football died after 1906 for, for almost basically a decade. And um, um, so he went back and coached and played for the best amateur team in Pittsburgh. And um, 
they played some amateur football in Ohio, but people didn't trust pro football anymore. They thought it was like studio wrestling. So eventually, um, there was a young boy who was in the bar in, in Canton that night when the fight broke out. He was, he was the, the water boy or ball boy for, for the Canton Bulldogs when he was 16 years old. His name was Jack Cusack, and he, when he was 22 in 1912, people approached him and said, I, I think that pro football thing was kind of fun, you know. Um, we should try that again. Would you be interested in, you know, leaving your job, basically? Thank oh, d was it the cord? Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay. Thanks. But th there, was, there was Blondie and his downward spiral uh, into a life of crime and, and Shiring going back to Pittsburgh. He did go back to Maslin for the Thanksgiving game, amateur game in 1907 and helped win the amateur championship. Um, and eventually even Georgetown, my alma mater, offered him the coaching job, which he passed on because he admitted, again being an honest fellow, that he didn't have a college degree, which they required. But he was inducted into the Western Pennsylvania Pro Football Hall of Fame, or, or Sports Hall of Fame, in posthumously in the 80s. And um, oddly, worth mentioning, that there's none of these guys from the, that era are in the Hall of Fame in Canton, which is sad, and they really deserve it. Um, and it's called the Pro Football Hall of Fame. It is not on purpose, it is not the NFL Hall of Fame. So they are eligible to be included, but they, and I've had this conversation with them and they say, well, there's too many of them. You know, there, there should be 20 of them probably. We don't know how, how to differentiate them. We don't have statistics. I said, well, I can help you with that. <laughs> well, I have all this stuff, you know. Um, start with the best teams, the best players and the best team, let's go from there, you know, well. But they're getting warm, they're warming up to the idea that they might, if not put busts in there for individual, they might have an exhibit, which I think makes sense for, for the group. Um, hopefully that will happen. So here's Jack Cusack, and eventually, so he, he leaves his job full time and, and takes on starting up the new Canton Bulldogs. And it's his brilliant idea to recruit Jim Thorpe, the world's greatest athlete, as he was known. Uh, winner of gold medals at the 1912 Olympics, a Native American, uh, to come and play for the can new V2 Canton Bulldogs. And, and they thought, like Christy Mathewson, it would bring people out. And it, and it did. People loved Jim Thorpe. And um, it became very popular again. Um, and before you know it, by 1920, there were 14 professional teams, not just in Ohio, but Illinois and um, Chicago, Green Bay, New York, other places, and 14 team owners got together in Canton and formed what was first called the American Pro Football Association, which two years later changed its name to the National Football League. And the Canton Bulldogs won the first championships in 22 and 23 and withdrew after 1926. Maslin was offered a team but didn't think they were big enough to pull it off so they didn't take a, uh, a spot. And Jim Thorpe was named the first president of the league as sort of as a figurehead while he was still playing. So the Hall of Fame is in Canton to a answer my first question. Because the NFL was formed there, not because pro football started there. That's the big answer. So what happens with Maslin though and its legacy, the high school team, as I said, took the name, continue the tradition of the Maslin Tigers. They've now played the Canton Bulldogs high school team for over 100 years in what they call the war since 1894. They did even play before they were called Tigers and Bulldogs for a few years. And in the 100th anniversary game in 1994, Maslin won again by one point on a missed extra point in overtime. And the kicker for the Canton Bulldogs is Josh McDaniel, coach of the Oakland Raiders right now. His father was the coach. <laughs> he says it's the worst moment in his life, <laughs> missing that extra point. Um, 
So they continue to play. And um, in July of 2012, Bob Shiring's great grandson discovered, <coughs> excuse me, those two trophies that I showed you from the newspapers from the Homestead team in 1900, 1901. They're now on display in that very first exhibit with the birth certificate of pro football in the rotunda. And they call them the first known pro football championship trophies, or AKA the holy grail of pro football. And that great grandson is me. <laughs> oh, love that look. <laughs> that's what I that's what I'm going for. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. This was <coughs> <coughs> that was the inspiration for all of this. Um so <coughs> I knew growing up that um my great grandfather, my grandmother had these pictures, including the one on the book cover on her wall in her house in this little town called Wilmerding, Pennsylvania, which is I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it again. Um, Wilmerding is in a little industrial town where the Westinghouse Air Brake Company still exists today. And George Westinghouse built the, co uh, the community around the plant. And a lot of my family, he, he brought my great grandfather uh, out there um, after his career to work and with his whole family from the downtown Pittsburgh area. And he became an executive there with a, a lot of the others. In and after working there, he started, he became the financial services guru for the whole town, uh, insurance, taxes, real estate, and everything. And the family jokingly called themselves the Kennedys of Wilmerding. <laughs> they were a big deal. Um, so my great-grandfather died seven years before I was born. Didn't get to know him, but a lot of stories. Not many about his, some were about the football, but most about how respected he was as a leader in their town. He, he was justice of the peace, he was a magistrate, he did all these things, um, and nobody <laughs> messed with <laughs> Big Bob. <laughs> so he was six feet and 240, which was huge at that time. So, um, but there were little bits of family lore, especially the scandal. And she, my grandmother knew that he didn't take a bribe, you know, to fix <coughs> the championship. And that that was, he was honored for that and known to be a good fellow. So as I go up through this journey, and you know, I start researching this stuff and putting the outline of the story together and finding these trophies in 2012, I, I, I was telling this uh, psychologist fellow that I know here in town that I play tennis with and uh, about finding the trophies. And he says, do you know who Joseph Campbell is? <laughs> And I said, <laughs> no, he, he's, but I think my daughter's studying him in, in, in literature in, in, at Westminster right now. And I said, yeah, that guy, he's, he's a mythologist. I said, I never knew there was such a thing as somebody who studies myths. He said he studied all the great myths of the world and he synthesized them into a common thread he calls the hero's journey. And basically, Campbell was hired by George Lucas in Star Wars to help create that story. And, and it's often a young person, often an orphan. Um, or Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, <coughs> and um, Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, and, uh, and others um, that hear a calling, a voice, a field of dreams. Um, <coughs> build it and they will come. The other line people forget about in Field of Dreams is heal his pain. Whose pain? What pain? Leave me alone, ghost. He thought it was Joe Jackson's pain. She was Joe Jackson. Uh, the whole movie, Field of Dreams, is basically a redemption story, which makes it a lot different than the other Black Sox movie called Eight Men Out, which was a nice movie with Jack, John Cusack, Charlie Sheen, and others about that episode. But it was a, a real s history story. Field of Dreams was something magical that, and a legend, <coughs> legendary film. So whether it was James Earl Jones, Terrence Mann, who was a writer, got to write again, got to go into the cornfield, be redeemed. 
um, Burt Lancaster, the doctor who gave up his baseball career to be a doctor, got to play again. <coughs> All the players came out of the cornfields, wanted to be forgiven. Um, <coughs> Kevin Costner, Ray Kinsella, didn't have a good relationship with his father. That was whose pain. So it, what the story is really all about is he said, you've done, you've healed their pain. <coughs> um, you took the hero's journey and discovered the holy grail of pro football, which is what Joseph Campbell said is the, the, the hero basically always gets a reward and he calls it the Holy Grail. And sometimes it's, he said, look what you got, it's, it's the chalice, it's, it's the trophy, it's, it's the real Holy Grail of, of pro football. But um, um, it, it can be other things as well for everybody else. And, and what um, Joseph Campbell's book is called the hero with a thousand faces. This is th the common journey that, that people take. And often there's a, a descendant involved like Darth, Darth Vader and Kevin Cost, you know, Costner's father, um, John Kinsella. The cover of the book is called, uh, it has this mosaic that's really beautiful with all these people that when you step away from it, it sort of shows the face of Jesus or somebody. They don't admit that it's Jesus, but it looks like Jesus, and basi basically Campbell's message is that we're all created by God to find, to take this journey and, and of discovery if we're open to it, and that um, there's a, a, re a reward set out there for us all, and, and but the, the chalice, the, the holy grail he describes isn't necessarily a, a cup of some kind, but it's really our hearts. And discovering that God has been with us all along, and um, and that's the prize. <coughs> Sorry, <laughs> it it it, uh, it, <coughs> it means a lot to me, and um, so now that the book's finally done, um, the journey continues. We'll see where it goes. Campbell says that the final step of the journey, when you come back from Kansas uh, or, or wherever on your magical journey leads you to the real world, that you, um, your job is to share it with your tribe, your community, and, um, and, and, and inspire them to do their own journey. So that's really why I'm here, is to tell you, you know, about the story and where, uh, what's possible for each of you to so I have had the pre pleasure of meeting several famous players, uh, Troy Aikman, Jerome Bettis, Herschel Walker, et cetera, but it's the average person, people that I've met that are so inspired by the story that is, means so much to me that um, they don't even necessarily like football, they, um, but they love the family connection and, and, and the history and, and the possibilities of it all. So um, most recently, I have also spoken at Maslin High School uh, before their big game this year. I spoke to the whole school, a thousand kids, and they make a big deal of it. Um, 15,000 people came to the game. They decked the school out in, in streamers every year, and, and it turned into a, a family reunion. We had 23 friends and family come from ac around the country to celebrate. And um, Maslin <laughs> won again <laughs> for the 12th time in 13 years, even though they're the smaller school. So there's also a movie. We're, we're working on a miniseries called Maslin. I think it should be called Canton, because people know Canton. But, and Blondie Wallace really becomes a bigger character than Bob Shiring. It's more interesting, um, the, the challenges he faced. But um, uh, we're working on selling that, if anybody has any connections in you know, <laughs> the, the film world. It's a great story. Um, and um, basically, it all inspires me to keep trying to do the right thing in, 
in my life. Uh, I do business valuation, as Claire mentioned. It's sort of a, a, a finance cop job. I try to you know, create win-win situations and negotiations for um, mergers and acquisitions and dis financial disputes and so on. So I'm um, kind of a middle and negotiator to, to help um, people not cheat, basically, a lot <laughs> in business. Uh, we went through all those companies. Stock options became a big problem. I set stock option prices for, for startup companies. This thing the IRS calls 409A, so if any of you need valuation work, I'm happy to help you with that, uh, as well as sell you a book outside and sign it for you. So um, that, that's basically the end of the story. And um, thanks for, for your time. I might have gone a little over time. I'm, I'm seeing the red light flash back there. But I went down a few extra rabbit holes for you all. Um, thanks for, for coming very much. Does anyone have any, any, questions? any questions? Happy to answer questions. Yes. Way back, your great grandfather um, was, was, you said he was a quarterback. No, he was a center. He w yeah, but he was, okay. He was a center, and that was the most important p position, not, right. the, not the quarterback. Right, before the forward pass. What was your feeling of why? Because it was all about running and the line play. That, that so you had, the, you had to as a blocker. Yeah, you had to block for the, the backs. So, you know, yeah. Much different game back then. Yeah. Any other questions? Anything else? I, I, I must have told, filled in all the, the the holes in the story. Yeah, lots in there in the book. Well, join me in thanking Greg yeah. again for being here tonight. Really appreciate Thanks. it. We're all looking forward to a really good game on Sunday, I hope. <laughs>